Well, how are you doing today? Doing well? You guys look great. But it is, uh, it is nice to be back. Over two years ago, I got to share with you. Uh, and uh, at that time, I was sharing a principle, a kingdom principle of how God uses this in the marketplace in stealth. And I kind of springboard off my background in nuclear engineering, and I rode fast attack submarines around the world for almost a decade. But the principle was about how God actually positions us all over culture for such a time as this. He takes your unique giftings and your vocation, and when you're just not expecting it, actually positions you in a place, and you need to be ready to act. Uh, but I wanted to stop, I wanted, before I even went any further, say thank you to Johnson Ferry Baptist Church. Um, many of you don't realize, but it is a very odd thing and a very incredible thing that a church stays committed to those out in the marketplace. So year after year after year, Johnson Ferry Church recognizes it just doesn't happen just in the church, that it is about the scattered church and where all of you go after church and are, are, are positioned throughout the marketplace. So thank you, Trey, and thank you, Pastor, for continuing to. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. And like Trey said, I have a, a, a business background. I ran a company in San Diego in energy and utility cost management. I'm going to share some of my own debacles that happened in business and uh, times where I fell into the uh, Monday morning atheism. But um, anyway, but I've had over the last almost 10 years the opportunity to run a workplace initiative called Work Life, and our mission has been to actually inspire people to find life in work. And if you ask most people you get a response of something like work is actually sucking the life out of them. And so we're trying to help people understand God's purpose for work and then actually find life in that work. But today, I'm going to go in a completely different direction, and I want to share with you uh, about a project that we just finished called Monday Morning Atheist. Monday Morning Atheist came from research that we conducted over, I don't know, probably about seven years and more intensely over the last year and a half where we took about 300,000 data points, and we ask ourselves, what is it that causes people to actually turn God off or switch God off at work? And it's very rampant. I saw it in my own life. And so what we did is we synthesized it, and we actually put it in this little executive book that you're going to get a copy of. This is a pre-release copy. This is not even released here in the U.S. It will be in the March. But we released it in Asia. So this is synthesized version of what we found in that research and what are the spiritual principles that actually cause people to kind of fall over into Monday morning atheism. So this is our goal to, to the body of Christ, though. We are screaming to the body of Christ and screaming to ourselves, stop the switch. Stop switching God off at work. What is it going to take to do that? But in order to start, I thought I would share a story from my own life and give you a little example and kind of set this up. This happens to be my very first Bible. Several years ago, I got this from my parents' house, and this taught me a lot about kind of how I processed my faith. You know, I gave my life to the Lord, uh, gosh, I think it was about eight or nine. And this was given to me in June of 1975. Now, you have to understand, when God redeemed me, I mean, I was, there was two words that described my life, even as a 9, 10, 11, and that would be creative destruction. <laughs> so, imagine driving home, for you, those of you that are parents, you drive home and you pull in the parking lot, and you see a five-foot burned hole through your garage door. <laughs> well, that was Doug and his little creative mind exper experimenting with chemical compositions in the garage as an aerosol fireball fires across the garage 10 feet and burns a hole through the garage door. <laughs> That's what my world was like. Another example of that, my, uh, my best friend crossed the line with me, and uh, he lived next door. And back in the day, we had chain link fence around the yard. Do you guys you get, you remember chain link fence? So... I thought, you know what, I'm going to blow this guy up. And so I saw enough things on TV, so what I did is I took the electrical cords going out to our pool, and I took coat hangers, and I wired those up. I created terminals on the, uh, on the electric fence, and I executed my plan. 
But little did I know, I didn't know too much about electricity. I executed my plan, and I just, I literally blew up the electrical system in my house. <laughs> so when God redeemed me, man, there was a lot of stuff he had to redeem. But here's what I noticed when I looked at my Bible, okay? I was looking at this, and I saw that, you know, I saw as an 8, 9, 10-year-old where I was grappling with my faith. You know, I had a lot of goals. I was a little entrepreneur. I started the first forced labor camp in my bedroom when I was a kid. I forced my brother to stay up with me every night to create pictures so that we could sell them for 25 cents the next day. So anyway, as I grappled and I, I, I gave my life to the Lord and I said, man, what, how is my life supposed to change? Well, I didn't really like what I read in this book. As I looked through this book, I was like, nope, nope, not that one, not this one. And so what I did is I came up with another creative idea, and I thought it was brilliant. And so every time that I came to the Word of God, I can see the ones that I agreed to, but every time I came to the Word of God and I, I found something that I didn't agree with, it kind of got in the way of my plans, my entrepreneurial plans as a little uh, uh, you know, young man. I, instead, of, instead of trying to conform my life to God's Word and His plan, I thought, you know what? What if I could just change God to conform to me? So what I did is I would get a marker or a pen, and I would literally cross out the Word of God, not applicable to me. Now, that's funny as a child, but here's the thing that's not so funny. You know, 35 years later, I still see evidences of that in my own life, and I bet you you do too. There's things that I'm challenged with in my own personal life, my character, my work, in which I just choose either subconsciously or sometimes intentionally or pressure or money issues where I just turn God off. I switch him off. I sort of cross him out. And so that, that kind of uh, got me to the point where, and that's kind of sort of where the title of Monday Morning Atheist that I am a recovering Monday morning atheist. Now, we have to understand, everybody knows what the definition of an atheist is, right? The definition of an atheist is someone who does not believe in God. So the definition of a Monday morning atheist is someone who believes in God, but who works like he does not exist. How many of you have found yourself working like God does not exist? Almost every hand, right? Right? I mean, I can be working, and two hours later, you guys have experienced this. It's like, where's God? I can be, and, and especially if something's pressing in on me, I think about James 1, 22 through uh, 25, where it says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing your face in the mirror, and then when you turn away, you forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and you don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you. Monday morning atheism is the insidious ability for us to know God and to love God and to believe in God, but to sometimes practice atheism in the way that we work. That brings us to the switch. You guys see the switch, and we're going to kind of see who is actually struggling with Monday morning atheism in the room. Now, don't get quiet because all of us struggle at some point, but, you know, God, God wired work in a way that we were supposed to depend upon him. Now, you know, when you flip a switch off, it only takes eight milliseconds for it to disrupt power through this switch. Eight milliseconds. So there's all types of different things in our work life. Maybe we're exhausted and out of balance. We're bored. We actually are struggling with sexual temptation. We're angry and critical. Or maybe you can't even find a job. There's all types of things that actually cause us to turn off God. And here's the interesting thing. Some of us, like me, even when things are supposed to be left off, I have a tendency to kind of force them on. And so as you look at this switch, here's how we fight Monday morning atheism. You have to, there's a grounding terminal on here. So everybody grab your switch and actually switch on. 
All right? All right, I can tell you we already, we already have a problem in the room. All right? Some of you are switching your switch on, but your switch is actually upside down, so your switch is actually off. And that's a typical problem, right? I have that all the time. Sometimes I assume my switch is on until I run into a debacle. But if you look at this switch, there's a grounding terminal. The grounding terminal represents the fact that we have to be grounded to the truth. We have to be grounded to God's truth about our work and our life, and we also have to be connected to the power. Now, the switch represents our heart and the choice that we have to keep God on at work or off. And so, as you think about that, and I wanted to share a little bit of the research that we, that we found, I want to I do a switch check real fast, okay? So, I'm going to throw out a couple issues that, that we have seen that cause people to switch off, and I want you to, to actually... Uh, Actually, switch your switch on or off. You ready? I'm seeking and hearing God when making work decisions. Switch on or off. Any trouble in the room on that? How many switches are off? Okay, we got a couple honest people. All right. (laughs) What about this? Do you effectively answer tough questions coworkers ask you about God, life, and faith? Switch on or off. How many switches are kind of challenged in that area? How many switches off? Or maybe we just don't even answer questions. What about, do I effectively resolve uh, conflict evolved in office politics, gossip, slander, favoritism, and unfounded criticism? Switch on, off. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to get a chance, you know, at the, at the end when we give you this, you're going to, you're going to be able to go personally to a, to a website called StopTheSwitch.com and actually, in, the, in your own privacy, take what we call a work personality profile. And actually, it'll show you the key issues that you may be struggling with personally. But I want to share a little bit about our research before we go any further. Um, now, who is affected by Monday Morning Atheism? I think we... We already, uh, we already found out that at times all of us fall into this, into this trap of actually turning God off. There's people like Peter, an IT specialist, who says, I know I shouldn't ignore God at work, but it's just so easy to do here. Does anybody have that when you're in a certain environment? It just, you sort of like a chameleon, and it's just, it's just so easy to just kind of blend in and turn God off. Anybody struggle with that? We found out 90% of people are struggling with work-life balance and are stressed and discouraged. These are Christians, okay? 61% fail to see kingdom purpose in their work and are unsure about how to talk about Jesus in today's marketplace. Then there's someone like Ann, a marketing consultant. She says, I find myself being two-faced at work like everyone else, and I can't seem to stop. We also found only 38% of workers think coworkers see Christ's character in them at work. 49% had any faith-oriented conversations with a coworker in the past six months. And only 45 believe that God has strategically positioned them for kingdom impact where they are. And then we have Helen here. She says, I'm around so much conflict, I don't even know how to deal with this. So the body of Christ and what we found over the years is the body of Christ has an, uh, just, it's, all of us can recognize the fact that we we flip God off or switch God off at work. And, you know, we have also found that good church members are some of the best Monday morning atheists, right? We learn, we just read uh, James 1, we go to church, we take on board, we hear great teaching. How long does it take for our switch to go off? When does yours go off? Sometime, you know, right when you leave the church? Yeah? Maybe Monday morning when you're on the freeway and you're, uh, you're having to deal with the tight fellowship on the freeway, right? <laughs> or maybe that first meeting when all of a sudden you've got to just kind of, you've got to pull it out and all of a sudden you just silently and accidentally the switch goes off. Well, what we did is from all these data points is we pulled out the three 
you know, the three false assumptions, the core false assumptions that in the general body of Christ, some of you may not struggle with these, but I'm going to share some of my own examples of how these things have caused me to actually really mess up in life. Really, I lost my family 13 years ago because of character and, and, and work issues. Now, God had healed that, but that was a lights out moment. But you know what? The truth was my switch was off long before I realized the lights were out. But anyway, these wrong assumptions, they cause big problems. And we've identified three of them. But before I go any further, I took this picture the other day because I was in my garage and I thought, oh, man, you know, have you, have you noticed that we have, an amazing, we have an amazing ability as human beings to kind of manage around problems, right? How many of you have broken things in your home, your car? Maybe, I know it's probably on your computer. And you just don't have time to fix them, right? And so you just kind of put up with them. Anybody? Right? Doors broken, things like that. Well, the garage door has been my nemesis over the last six months, right? The thing started acting up. I hate garage doors. You know, I can't, you know and there's, there's some short circuit in this thing, but we just kind of put up with it, Okay? Then we get in family fights of who's going to get out and go in the garage door and do the photo thing and press it and then run through the house and just, and you keep, you put up with this broken stuff. You guys do that, right? There's stuff in your house that you do the same thing and you just kind of, and then the longer you do that, it sort of just kind of becomes sort of routine and it becomes a part of your life, right? So finally I got fed up and I went down to Home Depot and, you know, they paid me to wire, you know, billion-dollar nuclear submarines, so I thought, you know, I've got to be able to fix this. And then my wife kind of prodded me, saying, you know what, you really ought to just call somebody. And that was like, that was like, that's another problem I'll talk about in a minute. But <laughs> I thought, I'm not going to call anybody, man. I can, I can wire this thing. So I went down to Home Depot, and I got 100 foot of this bell wire, and I, I'm, I've short-circuited things. I've taken all the safety devices out, and guess what? It's working. And my wife says, is it going to look like that? <laughs> so this is, this is the thing that I'm managing. But we do that in our spiritual life. We do that in our work life. We have these issues. We have these things that we just kind of put up with. What if there was a way that we could actually address those? What if there's a way we could find those things? And I think you're going to be able to do that as you kind of go through Monday Morning Atheist and actually start to look and examine at some of those things. So anyway, a little bit of electrical theory I'm going to translate over to uh, kingdom principle, okay? Now, most of you know this is Ohm's Law. Do you remember this from school? Some of you have seen this. You can kind of move this around. But the current or the flow through our lives, okay, current is, 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 current is, uh, is defined as the electrical charge through a conductor. I want you to think of yourself as a conductor in God's hand. God's ability to, throw his, uh, to, to flow his power through you to have incredible impact where he's positioned you, okay? Now, current is equal to voltage divided by resistance, okay? This is the potential energy. This is God's potential to work through you and what he wants to do you. And most of us would admit that that's infinite. I mean, God's ability to actually work in your life and to do amazing things is infinite. Now, here's the variable that gets us. It's the resistance. The resistance is defined is the conductor, you and me, the conductor's ability to resist flow. So we know from simple math, as the resistance goes up, flow goes down, right? So what are those areas of resistance? What are those areas that cause our switch to turn off? And so these are some of the top faith disconnects actually from the, from the research and some of the ones that you'll get to kind of wrestle through as you take the work personality profile. What about I'm unable to manage my time without being distracted by unfocused impulses or becoming a slave to my schedule? Whose switch kind of flipped off there, right? What about uh, I do not manage stress and discouragement by practicing the principle of rest and recreation? I'm sure everybody here practices the principle of rest and recreation, who switch just went off there? Okay. What about I'm not prepared to present the gospel message in a language that is clear, succinct, and jargon-free, yet faithful to the scripture? What if we tested everybody's switches? You see, we have these things. We have these things that cause our switch and doesn't allow God's power and his spirit to flow through us. We have these areas 
of resistance. So here's the three short circuits that I was telling you that we kind of pulled from the research that are sort of the overarching false assumptions or the, or the biblical lies. The first one is only some of life is spiritual. The second one is one I really struggle with, and it's, it's all up to me. I've got to do it myself. And the third one is my work is just a waste. So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time just overviewing these and giving you a little bit of an example from my own life. This first lie or this first false assumption is something we call spiritual schizophrenia. Now, we know that schizophrenia is a medical kind of psychological condition. It's a disassociation of where we live in kind of two different realities. We're sort of like a chameleon where we, we live this way in one world and then and then we put on different structure. We turn the switch off and we walk into another spiritual schizophrenia. The Monday morning atheist buys into the false idea that work isn't a spiritual activity at times. And it leads them to think that work and God have little to do with each other. Now, if we were asked, a lot of us, we would say, no, no, no. But our behavior, and that's why it's called Monday morning, because we love God. We want to serve God. And we know the practical things about we spend the majority of our waking hours and we face the majority of our challenges living in our faith. And we already engage in the majority of our relationships where? At work. That's where God wants to flow his power through us. Another way, we call this TV dinner Christianity, right? This looks kind of nasty, but where we kind of segment, we segment our life, right? We have our church life and we have our recreation and we have our work life. Remember when you used to cook these and, and, uh, and then the stuff would sort of bleed over into each other and sort of mix around? It's kind of like this integrated life that God wants to live. But we call this TV dinner Christianity when we have this ability to sort of segment our lives. But I'm going to share just a little bit of a story with you. Of, um, and it was a financially tragic story of when I practiced spiritual schizophrenia. I was in business in Southern California. I had an energy and utility cost management firm that I led. And we developed this technology. And uh, it was really cool, but I had a big problem. I, I could not, and we had to really move when we marketed this thing because the utility companies would fight us. And they're like, they're big boys, right? So we had to go fast. And I did not have the finance or the capability to actually penetrate the market as fast as we needed before the utility company could respond. So... That led me to find some marketers, and I found this organization in Newport Beach, California. And what I did is we started to develop a relationship, and we started to, I, I, we, we, we scoped out some, uh, some intellectual property agreements and stuff so that I could license this technology, and I saw millions. I mean, I was like, this is it. So here's what happened. So we started negotiating this, and I've been up there and back, and we were about ready to finish this thing. I was up there for the last day of negotiations. And nothing's, have you been in those situations where you're trying to work something out and just, some, it's not going well? Things are falling apart. All of a sudden, there's a deal point that wasn't on the table, and there it is, and things are just not going well. And my tendency was to keep pushing and keep pushing. Well, I had the voice of the Lord on the other side saying, stop, stop. But I kept pushing. It was 10 o'clock at night. I left that, no deal, Okay. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm in Newport Beach. I'm living in San Diego. I said, God, what's going on? I'm sick. You know, I, I mean, God was trying to get my attention in every way. I go outside. It's absolutely pouring rain. I go to my car. My car doesn't start. So I'm abandoned in Newport Beach. I mean, it's pouring. My suit is just sopped. I finally got a jump. I got in the car. I thought, I can't. I'm, I'm so delirious. I can't even see. I thought, I can't drive to San Diego two hours. So I went to find a hotel room. And there was, no hotel, there, was no, there was no room in the inn. There was, there was conventions in Newport Beach, and there was no room. So I had to pay this ungodly rate for the only, only room that was available on the top floor of some hotel. I went in there, and I was sopping wet. And I, and I sat, I went over there, and there was the Gideon Bible. So I opened the Gideon Bible, and it opened to Proverbs 1, and the Lord spoke to me. He gave me a rhema word, and it said, Son, when sinners entice you, do not walk along their path. Turn from them. So I said, oh, God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you're giving me direction. So you know what I did? 
See, back in those days, I used to carry Larry Burkett's, you know, business by the book, and I used to use that because I was really concerned about being unequally yoked and being, having the right kind of contractual arrangement. I did all this stuff, but I was not unwilling to listen to the voice of the Lord. So the next morning, I called the CEO, and I renegotiated the contract, thinking that I could just push forward. And as I'm doing this, I'm, I'm slowly, just like that, t- I'm slowly segmenting what I know to be right in my work. I started, I fell into spiritual schizophrenia in a big way. I signed the deal, and here's what happened. All hell broke loose. So within 90 days of disobeying God, I lost a million dollars. 90 days. I mean, some of you have disobeyed God, and have, your switch has gone off. I mean, it, I mean, I was trying. I love the Lord. I mean, I was trying to listen to him, but very subtly, I practiced spiritual schizophrenia. So I have a lot of other stories, but the truth is that it all belongs to God and that we are managers of his creation. Well, the second one, uh, the second short circuit that I want to, of the three that I want to share with you is something called it's all up to me. I'm all alone and I've got to do it myself. Has anybody had trouble with that? You run into a barrier. You're not sure if God's even there. You're not sure if he's going to act on your behalf, so you sort of just push forward. Well, Monday morning atheism operates with a self-sufficient, got-to-do-it-myself attitude. It accepts the lie that God is distant or maybe absent altogether. Now, I really, really, really struggle with this, this kind of lie, this underlying. And if you ask me face up, I, you know, even today I struggle with some of these. But, you know, just like, just like Jacob wrestled with the Lord, and he tried to manipulate things and tried to get things done and, and all that stuff. And finally, finally, after he's worn out and he's limping, right? And he says, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. I want to share another story that's kind of a sort of a supernatural story that uh, is a way that God started to heal me of this, of this false assumption, this, this kind of lie that causes me to sort of just push ahead and not really trust that God's even there. And this one's a very personal one. Uh, about three, about 2003, I, um, I was struggling with whether God was present. You know, what, if, you know like I said, God, are you, are you here with me? And so I was awoken in the middle of the night at, at 3.33 at night. All right? And that wasn't strange at first, but I was like, okay, 3.33, I went back to bed. So the next night, there I am again. I'm, I'm, I'm up at 3.33. So this time, though, I'm starting to sense the presence of the Lord. So every night, God would start waking me up at exactly 3.33 a.m. at night. He did that for almost six months. Every time I try to turn away from him, he would continue. He'd just keep waking me up. 3.33. Well, about two weeks into it, he led me to a scripture that's being sort of a, a motto of mine that I have continually tried to do. I do it in business meetings. I do it in life. And, uh, and he does it in dramatic ways and some, some miracle ways that I'm going to show you in just a second. But he led me to Jeremiah 33, 3, that says, call out to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. So the Lord's waking me up every night. I'm wanting to go back to sleep, but here's the creator of the universe saying, get up and cry out to me, call out to me. And he promises that he's going to show me great and mighty things. In the Hebrew, great and mighty or unsearchable things, it actually means fenced in or boxed in things. I was sharing this with the chairman of the board of one of the top investment firms with, over in Malaysia when we went to Asia. And, uh, and they're, in, they're, they, you know, they're in the, the markets and trying to discern the markets. And I said, man, do you think it would help if the creator of the universe showed you strategy for the markets if you cried out to him? Well, what happened is this began to escalate, and everywhere I went, God would say, you can't run from me, Doug. I'm right here. I would go down the street, and it would be the mailbox would be 333, and God saying, Doug, cry out to me. I would pull into CVS, honestly, in the water. These are all pictures from my iPhone. And the water would be 333, and I've learned to just stop and start crying out to God. I turn on the baseball game, and the guy's batting average is 333, and God says, Doug, cry out to me. 
and I will answer you. I was in a business meeting, and I pulled in in California to meet with the CEO. I pulled right next to a car, and the license plate is 333. I mean, I can go on. I got thousands of these stories where it's just absolutely miraculous the way God's teaching me that he's never leaving me. He's here. He's ready to act on my behalf. I can go to the golf course. We were just talking about golf. And the balls can be 333. I go to the grocery store. SOS, God's saying, cry out to me. And it's $3.33. Now, here's what happened. I, uh, I went to Asia, like I told you, and I was, I was in a Wednesday night prayer meeting. I was praying, God, I want you to do something so supernatural that I don't have to just talk to these people. I want them, I want them to see the, how you can work through their lives. And so I left the prayer meeting up in North Georgia, and I was going down a road in, in, uh, in North Georgia. Five minutes after, I pulled into a gas station with my son, and I said, oh, God. I pulled into the gas station, and the gas was exactly $3.33. The brand was what? Pure. And I just was worshiping God there, right there, right there at the gas station. I went home. I had to select my seat on Korean Air. I opened up Korean Air. I had to fly, you know, 15 and a half hours to, to Seoul, South Korea. My plane had exactly 333 seats on it. God said, Doug, you can't, you can't get away from me. So I just keep worshiping God. I said, oh, God. And so I'm on the flight to Korea. And so I, I actually am I'm about seven hours into the flight. And I start, once God starts doing this, I start getting a swagger. You know, for once, I start trusting God that he really can do it. He can act on my behalf. He can do things in business. He can show up. He wants to. He's waiting for us to ask him. So I'm on the plane, and I, I get a little swagger to me. I said, all right, God, do it again. So I start asking him. I said, come on, show me, show me your power, God. So I'm on, I have, I'm, on a, you know, I'm on this big plane. I, I'm on the navigation screen. I flip over to another screen and select a music track. And the music track is exactly 3 minutes and 33 seconds. I said, okay, God, what else? I flipped back. We're, we're, we're leveled at 42,000 feet, man. We're way up there. We're up by the North Pole, kind of, you know, coming around. And, uh, and so we're leveled at 42,000 feet. I flipped back to the navigation screen. And in those 10 minutes, I was over at the music track. The plane had lowered and leveled at 33,300 feet. I said, oh, my gosh, I'm in my plane. I, I'm just worshiping God. And so it goes on. I land in Korea, and I go on to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And I said, God, would you do it again? And so I grab my bag. I go up to the Muslim security guard, she, a female. She was full headdress. And I handed her my passport, and I said, 333. Her security badge was 333. And she says, excuse me, sir. And then the, the male security guards, they come around me. They're all, I was like, oh, my gosh, I've stirred up. And then I made a dumb American mistake. I asked this female Muslim security guard if I could take a picture of her chest. <laughs> so anyway, I said, oh, my gosh, I didn't know what to do. So I took my iPhone out, and I just started showing them pictures of 333. And, and the most amazing thing happened right there in the international airport of a, of a highly aggressive Muslim country, all the Muslim security guards started saying, three, 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 three. They were all crying out to God. It was like incredible. They let me, let me take the picture, and, uh, and here's, the, here's the three, three, three. So I land, and I'm doing research on the electrical system of this place, this island of Borneo, which is Indonesia and Malaysia, where I was going to be sharing, and there was this conference, and all these business leaders, and the Donald Trump of Asia was there. And I was doing research, and the very location that we were was the, uh, the state of Sabah. But the electric transmission grid that actually supplied the very place where we were was exactly 333 megawatts. You think God's, I mean, that's how intimate God wants to speak to us and move through us and wants to help us to keep the switch on. I could go on and on. I, I, I showed up, a guy picked me up. I went to the front. I was getting ready to come into the resort, the front of the resort, 333. So, cry, call out to me and I will answer you. 
The other, the last, uh, the last short circuit is, a, uh, is one, my work is just a waste. And it's just a paycheck for me. And many of us are aware of this one. But Monday morning atheism leads us to believe that the task in our daily work may be worthless in the eyes of God. And we know that's not true. And we know that God delights in what we do, and he's designed us uniquely, and he enjoys our work like a father delights in a child. So, in review, the three, the three kind of false assumptions that, that have come from this research have been only some of life is, is, is spiritual. It's spiritual schizophrenia. It's, it's up to me. I've got to do it myself. And I think I've shown just, a, just from my own personal testimony the way God is waiting for us and is waiting for us to ask him, to call out to him so that he can move through us. And then also, my work is just a waste. So how do we turn on the lights? Just some practical steps that we can take, okay? How do we restore the power? Now, we talked about the light switch. We talked about we need to actually stay grounded to the truth and connected to the power. So what I encourage you to do, Monday Morning Atheist is kind of set up like a five-week journey. So it's a synthesis of what I've been telling you here in the research, but it's very, very approachable. You could read this on the plane, but it's also set up like a five-week journey. You could do it in a small group. But we're going to give you one of these out here, which is a pre-release copy that we brought back from Asia. And so I encourage you to kind of walk through this and challenge yourself and actually go to, uh, like I said, stoptheswitch.com and actually take the personal profile and find out these areas of resistance that God could enlighten, uh, enlighten you and help you kind of walk. So here's kind of how it works. You take the book and you can go take the profile. And then you're going to get an actual report that's going to be sent to you in email. And then, you, then there's other tools and different things you can do for that. But I hope that just kind of giving you a little bit of overview of what we've learned from this research and what we kind of laid out in Monday Morning Atheist. And maybe there's some of those stories that, that a lot of us, all of us could actually start taking the opportunity to actually stop switching God off at work. I mean, he's waiting for us. He's waiting to flow through us and do amazing things. I didn't have a chance to tell you half of the things that he's done, the miraculous things he's done through work, through finance, through all kinds of ways. So I just encourage you to stop the switch. So thank you for allowing me to share.